Okay, so I think we'll get started. Um, hello, my name's Sinead. I'm a third year medic currently on my GP placement in Northampton. And today I will hopefully be running you through some high yield um, head and neck emergencies focusing on neurological um, with some rheumatology just to lighten things up and some kind of trauma thrown in there. Um, so these are my intended learning outcomes. They are very long and detailed um, but hopefully it'll just help to break it down with a few cases and I'm hoping to make it as interactive as possible so if you can stick anything in the chat it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong just have a go um, a lot of this is kind of linking to phase one with some phase two management thrown in there so it might be a bit rusty that's fine um, but this is more just for your own reference after the session so I thought I'd just start with a little brain warm up on some clinical signs. So pop the names of any of these into the chats. And if you can say what causes it as well. Yeah, battle sign, great, yeah. Yeah, periorbital ecchymosis, lovely. Anyone know the third? Hemotympanum, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. So what we're talking about here is kind of the um, basal skull fracture. So I just wanted to kind of go through the anatomical basis of this. Um, and we know that in that anterior cranial fossa, the kind of posterior boundary of that is the lesser wing of the sphenoid, which they love to go on about. Um, can anyone name, kind of link into those clinical signs, what areas of the basal skull are going to be fractured to result in some of those signs we've just seen in the anterior cranial fossa particularly? I've put some handy arrows. Um, you, you're close, it's, it is near to the petrous part, but just a bit anteriorly, there's kind of two areas that I'm thinking of in particular. Yes, fantastic. So you've got your orbital plate that can be fractured, um, and then the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Um, and these are going to result in your like raccoon's eyes, the periorbital ecchymosis, and kind of other signs like CSF rhinorrhea um, or kind of blood. So if you've punctured the jora or you've punctured kind of a blood vessel with the parts of the fracture, um, then you're going to have these clinical signs. And then moving on to our middle cranial fossa, um, which we know is kind of bounded by the, again, the lesser wing of the sphenoid and the petrous part of the temporal bone posteriorly. So there are kind of three signs that you can get in this area. Yeah, CSF otorrhea, fantastic. And then, yeah, the other two we've we've already seen. So you've got your battle sign, the mastoid ecchymosis, um, the hemotympanum, and your CSF or blood otorrhea as well. Fantastic. OK, so moving on to some other fractures now. So there are kind of two neck fractures that you want to be aware of. Um, so you've got your C1 or your atlas fracture and C2 and axis. So let's start with C1. Um, can anyone tell me the colloquial or the eponymous name for these, this fracture? Jefferson? Yes, it is Jefferson. Fabulous. Oh, I should have asked you C2 as well, but that's the other one. So that's Heinemann's fracture. Um, amazing. And then for the next bit, there is going to be a lot of you doing the work, guys. Um, but I want kind of the mechanism of injury. So what causes, let's start with Jefferson first. What's kind of the pathophysiology which links to that? So can you describe the fracture type? 
And then is there any um, spinal injury? So is there any myelopathy, spinal cord injury? Yeah, fantastic. So this is the one with your axial loading. Can you give me kind of an example of any mechanism of injury that might be typical? Yeah, fantastic. So diving into shallow water or shallow pool. Yeah, fantastic. And what kind of fractures involved? Is it kind of, does it cause myelopathy or not? Yeah, fantastic. Amazing. So uh, I think it just makes sense, this fracture. So if you know the anatomy of your atlas, which is kind of the polo mint, then if you fracture, if you try to break your polo mint, you're breaking it in more than one area. So they call it kind of a burst fracture. Um, and it's because you've got that C2, which is the endontoid peg, isn't it, coming through, which causes that burst. So if you imagine that kind of axial loading and C2 kind of pressing into C1 and causing it to burst, then you've actually widened the spinal canal. And that's why you're unlikely to have any kind of neurology involved in this injury, because you you made the diameter of the spinal, where the spinal cord sits bigger. So you're unlikely to have any kind of, yeah, neurology. Um involved so people with this normally do quite well and they might present with obviously kind of neck pain of the classical history but they might be kind of holding their head in their hands and their gcs is normally all right um that being said the force that's needed to cause this kind of fracture can sometimes cause some neurology um okie dokes moving on to our c2 or hangman's fracture I'd like the same things again, if you may. So kind of mechanism of injury, what's the pathophysiology? Um, what kind of fracture is it? And is there any myelopathy? Yeah, whiplash, good thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, RTC, really good shout. Can anyone remember kind of the anatomy of where the fracture occurs? Or is the spinal nerve, spinal cord involved? Yeah, really good thoughts there. So your hangman fracture occurs with the hyperextension of the C-spine. Um, so this typically, I like to think of it as kind of whiplash on steroids because typically your whiplash injury is a soft tissue injury caused by the force kind of hyperextension, hyperflexion. Um, but this time you've obviously got that bony involvement where you fracture um, the pars into articularis bilaterally. But really that's, you know, that's academic. It's it's not good um, is what you do need to know about this fracture. And it's very often likely lethal, if not causing unconsciousness and respiratory and cardiac arrest um, because you've you've ruptured the spinal cord so high up. Um, and even if the kind of bony fragments are staying the same, you've not got that burst. So you're not really kind of widening the spinal canal, but it's not a lot smaller either, depending on where the fragments lie. But kind of the force that's required to sustain this fracture means that you're, it's very likely lethal or people are presenting with a very low GCS. Cardiac and respiratory arrests are quite likely. Um, so it's a really important one to be aware of. Um, but yeah, with both of these, I try to think RTC because atlas injury can also occur when you're kind of... Um, if you hit your head on the roof of a car, you've got that same like axial loading, impaction um, kind of injury. So for both of these, think RTC. And that's yeah how I kind of remember them. The mechanism of injury and the pathophysiology, they kind of go together. 
if you don't. Yeah, so hangman's fracture is much more likely to affect the spinal cord. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So moving on to kind of, oh, my, my image has gone sad on this, but she was meant to be on kind of a red phone. So this is a call coming through to ED um, as a 25 year old man who was involved in a fight outside a bar. He was knocked to the floor where he remained unconscious for a few minutes. He subsequently walked off from the scene of the accident, but his partner's rung a few hours later as he's become confused, followed by drowsiness now as well. So the paramedics assessment is that his GCS is 9, his blood pressure is 140 over 95, heart rate's 102, respirate 16 and his oxygen set to 99 on uh, um, and they are five minutes out. So what is your initial management for this patient going to be? So talk me through what you're going to do, what investigations include in bedside bloods and imaging as well. Amazing, yeah, you're going to do your A to E assessment. Yeah, CT head's going to be important, isn't it? Yeah, 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 fantastic. And that's all going to be in, kind of included in your A2E, isn't it? Yeah, neuro exam, yeah, you might do after the A2E because it's important to manage those things that are going to, you know, kill the patient first. Airway adjuncts and advanced airway might become really important, especially with a drop in GCS. And you want to check that blood glucose as well is really important. Fantastic. Any bloods that you might want for this gentleman? Given kind of any differentials and feel free to pop them in the chat as well. Yeah, is he bleeding? Yeah, really good thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Does anyone think of any differentials for this gent? Yeah, toxicology is a good one. Yeah. Yeah, an extra or a subdural. So, yeah, fantastic. So given that we think that this man is most likely probably going to need surgery, we want to kind of do bloods that focus on that. So I've put FBC, UNEs, LFTs, just because we want kind of a baseline. If we're going to use some anaesthetic, um, we need to know how his kidneys and his liver are functioning, clotting for the reasons we've said. And you want to get a group and save and cross match as well. If he's bleeding, um, he might need some blood. Um, and a VBG is going to give you your glucose and your lactate quite accurately and quite quickly. So those would be that would be nice to get as well. And we mentioned kind of A2E and initial stabilization and a CT as well. So what I was getting at with this um, kind of the history of our S bar, and if I just go back, is there's kind of this latency period, which is very typical illness script of a particular um, hematoma that you've already mentioned. Um, and if I show you this, are you able to describe the image and tell me your your most likely differential now? Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, lentiform, love to hear it, yeah. Yeah, mentioning all suture lines, lovely. Yeah, fantastic. Um, you've got this kind of bright white, hyper dense kind of lentiform, or you can say biconvex as well, appearance suggestive of that extra jaural, amazing. And linking back to our pathophysiology and kind of anatomy as well, can anyone explain what kind of artery might have injured, what fracture might have occurred? Yeah, the middle meningeal artery, amazing. Yeah, 
I'm worried I've made this too easy for you guys. Um, yeah, so fantastic. So you've got the MMA runs in underneath the terry on the kind of the weakest part of the calvarium because it's the thinnest. Um, and if you, yeah, you're going to rupture that middle meningeal artery and then you've got kind of your inner table of bone and the the periosteal dura and this hematoma creates enough pressure to strip the um, the periosteal dura off the inner table of bone, which obviously causes that lentiform hematoma, but it's strongly adhered at the sutures, which is why you get that kind of lentiform appearance. Um, fantastic. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so if we have a look at patient number two, um, this presents with a kind of a headache and a gr more a gradual onset of the neurological symptoms. So thinking about our illness strips and how this is different from that latency period that we see. And in addition to the scan, any differentials for this? Yeah, amazing, subdural. And is anyone able to link it to the pathophysiology? Why does it present in this way? Why is it such a gradual onset? You know, he's bleeding in his head. Why isn't he really, really sick really soon? Yeah, amazing. So it's venous, yeah, um, as opposed to arterial. And again, you've got this bright white hyperdense, but this time it's a crescent shape, isn't it? That makes you think of subdural. And you've got that. There's no sutures this um, this time restricting this hematoma. And now we can see that midline shift with the ventricles. We're losing our ventricles there over to one side, um, which makes us more suspicious of a subdural. Um, any risk factors for this? Yeah, elderly. Why? Why does that happen? Anticoagulants, yeah. Yeah. Can you expand more? If it was a three mark question in SAQ, the brain shrinks, so what's the result of that? Yeah, the bridging veins, they shear because there's more tension. So if you imagine the skull here and the brain here, if your brain's shrinking, you've got more tension on these veins in between. And so they're more likely to kind of snap and bleed. Um, amazing. Yes. And the, yeah, alcoholic, that was the other one I was thinking of as well. So if you're um, using alcohol to excess, you're going to have decreased clotting factors. Um, fantastic. Okay. I just wanted to touch as well on um, raising cranial pressure. So obviously these patients are going to have um, signs of raising cranial pressure. Um, but I just wanted to touch as well on kind of cro more chronic presentations of this um, and just a bit of background on pathophysiology. So your normal um, range for adults is 5 to 15 millimetres of mercury. Um, and obviously when you're coughing and sneezing, kind of straining, you get this transient rise and it can go up to kind of 20, but it's the sustained kind of rise that we worry about and that results in like pathology. Um, so that would be over 20 millimetres mercury for a few minutes. And can anyone remember there's a particular doctrine um, that we refer to to kind of explain raised intracranial pressure and the pathophysiology behind it? Double effects may be another thing that I've not heard of, um, but I will go away and look that up. Yeah, Marie Monroe Kelly, that's the one I'm thinking of, the Kelly Monroe Doctrine. Um, and this is the one I could have quizzed you again, but I will give you a break. So you've got your three constituents that make up um, kind of your cranial volume your brain parenchyma, your blood, and CSF. So in any kind of increase in volume of one of these constituents must result in an equal and opposite decrease in one or more of the others. So because you've got that fixed cranium, you can't expand the volume, then one of these has to compensate for that. Um, it's just something to bear in mind. Fantastic. Okay, so 
Moving on to kind of late and early signs of recent cranial pressure. Um, and I use these terms loosely because obviously, so for the patients we've just seen, they will be presenting with kind of the late signs acutely. Um, so this is kind of referring to more broad, more chronic uh, rise in intracranial pressure, where it starts off with like more seemingly benign symptoms and then later on is progressing. But I hope to touch on some of the red flags um, that you might see and some early signs that might make you suspicious. So can anyone throw in the chat? Let's start with the early signs. Yeah, headache. Anything in particular about a headache that might make you worried? Fan type, yeah. Could be. Worse on bending, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, nausea and vomiting. Fantastic. And then aside from a headache, what else? Yes, visual changes. Anything else? Papilledema, fantastic. Yeah. And can you expand on visual changes? So any anything in particular? Yeah. Yes, lovely. Seeing some lovely stuff in the chat. Yes, okay. So I'll go through. Um, so decreased visual acuity. So start first with your kind of eye signs um, or a visual field defect might make you worried. And then papilledema, um, as you mentioned, and a little quick fire SAQ randomly in here, but one of these is papilledema and one of them is glaucoma. Um, can anyone suggest which is which? Um, and kind of describe the images as well. Yeah, the right is glaucoma, yeah. And how do we differentiate between these? The picture's kind of giving it away, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, fantastic, yeah. So it's the increased kind of cup to disc ratio or bigger kind of increased optic cupping in glaucoma. Um, whereas in papilledema, it's the whole optic disc that is engorged. And I try and remember this is kind of nipple-like. So papil means nipple, um, like papilloma kind of thing. It's like engorged and it looks quite different from your optic disc cupping that you see in glaucoma. So yeah, fantastic. Bit of fundoscopy there. And then someone said in the chat as well, six nerve palsy. Um, so yes, any strabismus or diplopia would make you concerned. Um, and I did try to be original and find my own image for this, but no one does it better than the legend that is Lisa Quinn. So excuse my theft. But um, so can anyone re remember what sign I'm referring to here? Um, why is that six nerve palsy so important and so significant? Yeah. Fantastic. Can anyone remember the name for this? Okay, so this is niche, but this is your kind of false localizing sign. So you're absolutely right. Um, there is a very vertical route and it's because it kind of originates from the ponto medullary junction. So it's at the very base of the pons where the pons becomes the medulla. Um, and then it kind of travels very vertically, um, very steep incline up where it enters the cavernous sinus at the junction of the superior orbital fissure, which is a lot, but they're kind of your three landmarks you want to know. Um, and it's because of that very vertical route um, 
that it kind of falsely localizes. So any rise in like global intracranial pressure will put extra tension on that nerve as it's kind of going vertically. Um, and that kind of makes you think, oh, it could be a lesion around kind of the root of this nerve. But actually, it's that global rise in pressure putting tension on that nerve because it's got such a unique kind of course that's easily kind of put under tension, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, really good thinking on that one. And then coming on to the headache um, we mentioned nausea and vomiting, and we also mentioned some exacerbating factors. So it's worse kind of typically in the morning, kind of coughing, straining, um, and then it's worse kind of positionally provoked as well quite often. Okay, and then what about our late signs? So these are the kind of your more obvious neurological things. What else? Mm -hmm. Changing consciousness, yeah. Yeah, Cushing's triads. Seizures. Bonus points for um, knowing what kind of the triad of Cushing's triad is. <laughs> But I think those are some of the ones that I had originally. Bradycardia, hypertension, respiratory depression. Yeah, so reduced GCS, focal neurology, seizures, pupils. They can kind of constrict at first and then later kind of dilate. And then your Cushing's triad is a bradycardia, I don't know why I've written falling pulse, rising BP, so hypertension and bradypnea. Um, but just to note that this is a very, very late sign. Um, so even though these are kind of late in the range of chronic raised intracranial pressure, Cushing's triad is very rare. Um, so it's not the most sensitive, but it is, it can happen. Okay, so taking a break from the hardcore neurology, um, I thought I'd bring in some room because it is an emergency condition and it does cross over with neuro with some of the complications of it. So can anyone put in the chat, what is GCA? Um, kind of what are the risk factors for it? Who's your typical patient? And a strong association that we need to be aware of. Yeah, PMR, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So like most things in room, it's going to affect your females. Um, it's a little bit older than normal, so over 50, um, but kind of in most cases, decades over 50. And yes, PMR, fantastic. Yeah, and it's the inflammation of kind of medium and large arteries as well. Fantastic. This chronic vasculitis of small, medium sized arteries, mostly affecting that superficial temporal artery there. Okay, so the next one is for people who like a mnemonic. Um, the nice one to remember for GCA is giant. Um, and I kind of like to do this from back to front just because the first few are kind of presentation and risk factors, and then the last two are your investigations that you want to do as well. So going from T, um, I won't make you read my mind, but this is your temporal artery abnormalities. So this hat sign has a very high positive predictive value. So if you see this, think GCS, GCA. Um, it's, it can be nodular, it can be pulseless as well, which can be kind of, yeah, features. Um, and then I really like this picture because she is like your typical candidate, but typically it's a unilateral headache. So try and forget the other hand. It's typically one sided, um, a new temporal headache. And then, as I mentioned before, kind of age over 50, but usually kind of decades over 50. 
And then I was going to ask you investigations, but I've just spilled the beans on the first one. So raise kind of ESR, CRP, um, you can do plasma viscosity as well. Um, and then can anyone remember kind of your definitive diagnostic test that you want to do as well? Yeah, biopsy. Fantastic. And what are you looking for on that biopsy? Yeah, they are skip lesions, yeah. Um, I'm looking for kind of a particular type of inflammation, giant cells, yeah. So it's kind of granulomatous inflammation, and that's with your giant cells as well. So this is a bit of a mean question, but it kind of links back to Path Pro. And um, does anyone know why you get kind of this multinucleated giant cells or granulomatous inflammation? Okay, this was a meme one, um, but I randomly came across it in my notes and I feel like they loved it in Path Pro, so it could easily be an SBA, but um, kind of like frustrated phagocytosis. So it's kind of like the phagocytes are all combining together um, because one is not enough to kind of defeat the infection. So you also get it in like TB and sarcoid um, where there's an immune response, but it's all kind of coming together like a little army to kind of attack um either a pathogen or what the immune system's overreacting to so like frustrated phagocytosis i feel like i feel like they loved that in path pro it's bound to come up but yeah so there's your completed mnemonic and then moving on to management can anyone remember the management of gca yep yeah, amazing. Yeah, very high dose prednisolone, so kind of 40 to 60. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And aspirin, yes, wonderful. Um, so I don't know why this has slipped off my slide again. I hope I'll fix that before we send them out. Um, but this is kind of your empirical prednisolone. So the important thing to note is that whilst getting a biopsy is great, you don't delay that. Don't delay treating to get a biopsy um, and have a definitive diagnosis. If the clinical suspicion's there, you need to treat it immediately to prevent that loss of sight. And someone's mentioned as well, kind of 50 to 60 milligrams. So what is the thing that makes you think, OK, this person needs low dose, this person needs high dose? Can anyone remember what symptoms? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Exactly. So this is your visual symptoms. So blurred or double vision. And important to note as well, this can actually happen weeks or months after the onset of the headache. So still keeping that in our illness scripts and keeping it in your back of your mind thinking, is this GCA? Um, and maybe we need to start some prednisolone. So fantastic. Yeah. Low dose or high dose. And then you also give 75 milligram aspirin. Um, as well and that decreases the risk of visual loss further and the risk of stroke as well so um, a few things to switch on in terms of management is that you should expect a rapid diagnostic response to the prednisolone um, for example if the symptoms haven't improved in kind of 24 to 48 hours then you should be considering another diagnosis so it's kind of part of the investigation and the management I guess as well if you've not got that biopsy and you're kind of still monitoring to see has this had an improvement in symptoms? Yes, it's GCA or no, we need to go down another route. Um, so, yeah, that's all well and good. But what else, what other advice do we need to give to the patient regarding being on kind of long term high dose steroids? And if there are any zeros final fans out there, yeah, this picture will make sense. <laughs> yeah, don't stop your steroids suddenly. So for kind of steroid advice, I remember the don't stop mnemonic. So the don't is standing for don't stop taking your steroids because there's obviously that risk of adrenal crisis. And then is there anything else that people can think of? 
steroid advice or anything else you might prescribe. Yeah, bisphosphonates, great. Yeah, PPI, good. Fantastic. Yeah, so the S stands for your sick day rules. Um, T is the treatment card. O for osteoporosis prevention. And this isn't kind of a one rule for all. So you need to check the calcium um, and you only supplement the calcium if it's low. Um, and you can give vitamin D as well and bisphosphonates depending on the FRAC score. Um, so you check them for their risk of osteoporosis on steroids and then you can give that prevention if it's warranted. Um, PPI as well for your gastric protection. Fantastic. And then in terms of stopping the steroids, you kind of want to wait until they're symptom free from the GCA. Um, so you might need to go increase the dose from 40 um, and then you're going to start weaning once they're symptom free um, and just close monitoring for any kind of relapses as well. Okay, so moving on to our next topic, which is stasis epilepticus. Um, so can anyone stick in the chat what is stasis epilepticus? Yeah, seizure lasts in more than five minutes. And there's kind of another bit of criteria as well. Yep, more than three in an hour. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, more than five minutes or more than three within an hour. And it's kind of without complete recovery in between. Yeah, no time to rest. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So then coming on to your management here. So obviously you're going to do an A to E. Um, can people mention kind of any salient points of this bit? In fact, I'll run you through because you've been way too smart and it's probably patronising. <laughs> OK, so you're going to secure your airway using kind of adjuncts or advanced airway if needs be. Um, your, oh, before you do this, you're going to check the time because you need to time the seizure. Um, so that's actually a really important job for the person at the end of the bed um, to be doing. And it helps you in your management that we'll come on to later as well. Um, then you're going to give your oxygen. So emergency is 15 litres a minute. Um, I mean, obviously, if their sats are low. And then for in C, there's quite a bit of kind of stuff you need to be doing um, in a seizure. So you want to have continuous blood pressure monitoring because seizures and also your anti-epileptic drugs can cause hypotension. Um, you obviously want to get IV access and you can give Pabrinex if they if you suspect kind of alcoholism or they appear malnourished. Um, you also obviously want to take off some bloods in C. Um, so you might want to get FBC, UNEs, LFTs, a calcium as well and a glucose is what the UHL guidelines advise. Um, fantastic. You might as well check your anti-epileptic drug levels, kind of see have they been taking their medication, that kind of thing, and toxicology if it's appropriate, although you won't have that back in the emergency setting, but it might inform management further down the line. Um, obviously, I want to check the BM as well as a few other things in D, but the BM is really important in seizures. And you can give 50 mils, 50% 50 glucose if it's less than four. Um, and then exposure. You want to put them in the recovery position if you're kind of in an outpatient setting. But if you've secured your airway, you're probably OK on that front um, and with a lot of supervision in a hospital. Um, and then you importantly want to give your first dose full, first dose of full dose benzodiazepine. So four milligrams lorazepam um, and get some urgent neuro input as well. Can you give them dextrose? Um, This is a very good question. I can check and I can get back to you on that unless any other committee members know the answer. It's a good question. Um, 
to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'll check if no one answers. Um, remind me at the end if I forget. <laughs> okay, so kind of time's ticking on. So obviously you're going to have someone repeating your A to E kind of just over and over again. You want to know if this patient is deteriorating, are they stable, kind of where they're up to. Someone's going to be on that all the time. Um, but say kind of in... After another five minutes has gone by, they've not responded to that initial dose of the IV lorazepam. What is your next step in management? Yes, yeah, so you're going to give them another four milligrams IV lorazepam. Um, wonderful. Yeah, in five minutes. And then kind of say they're still seizing after five minutes again. What would be your next step in management then? Yes, amazing, yeah, IV phenytoin, um, and there are a few other options as well, like you can give Keppra or you can give sodium valproate, but obviously we need to be cautious in females of reproductive age because it's teratogenic as well. Um, and then at kind of, I put 30 minutes because that's what the guidelines say, but really you want to be having early ITU input, um, you want to if you're looking at kind of anaesthetizing them and giving them some mechanical ventilation. So, yeah. Yeah, ECG is a really good shout. So I should have put that in C, really, because um, you want to make sure there's no cardiac cause for the seizure. Yeah, amazing. Okay. And then kind of say they've come around or they've not come around, but you've got other people there to help you at this point. What you want to do next is kind of assess for any precipitating cause. So, yeah, like you mentioned, looking for any cardiac cause, any meningism, kind of raised into cranial pressure or any focal neurology. So you want to do a full peripheral and cranial nerve exam, any signs of recent head trauma. So you'll just be doing kind of a top to toe kind of um, examination, looking for anything that might have contributed to this seizure. OK. So now coming on to our um, kind of CNS infections, I probably shouldn't have said that. I should have just read the script because I should have been testing these, but it's quite straightforward, this bit anyway, um, hopefully. OK, so we've got a 24-year-old university student who presents to the medical assessment unit with a two-day history of feeling generally unwell. Um, they've been in bed all day today with the blinds drawn, just complaining of a headache that's come on gradually but is now persisting and is severe. Not is feeling nauseated but no vomiting, not noticed any rash. She's very uncomfortable and she's not given you much history so you proceed to your examination. Um, she's alert but she appears quite unwell. Resps are 22, sat above 94% so we're not worried there. Um, heart rate's 105, blood pressure's 115 over 85, temperature's 38.1 and she's kind of unable to touch her chin to chest but you're unsure if that's sensitive because she's quite drowsy and feeling a bit unwell and is not very compliant with you when you're examining her. Um, but we know notice that Brodinsky's sign is positive and Koenig's sign is negative. So can anyone kind of remember what these niche tests are? Yeah, does involve flex in the neck, yeah. That's good. I'll go through these because they are, I feel like they're quite examinable and they did come up in um, phase one, but they are, they're not very frequently used in practice, especially with such a compelling history as we've got here. But if she's not very compliant with you, this it might be a good thing to try. Um, so Brudinsky's sign is kind of passive flexion of the neck and that causes the, the hips and the knees to flex. And it, if you imagine kind of the meninges going along the spinal cord, you can imagine the tension on the meninges and that's resulting in that pain and the flexion of the hips and the knees. Um, and then Koenig sign, again, a similar principle, but you flex the knee to 90 degree and the hip to 90 degree, and then you extend the leg. Um, and it's either kind of restricted or um, you, you've got that pain as well again. Okay. 
So just good to be aware of, but not majorly going to change your life. Um, but yeah, um, for the bacterial or viral causes, so kind of differentiating between the two, can anyone remember how, say, a bacterial lumbar puncture might appear or what you might see on kind of cytology or anything like that? Yeah, cloudy, brilliant. Low glucose, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Okay, and then kind of viral, how does it differ? Yeah, viral's clear, yeah. What type of white cells might you see? Yeah, high lymphocytes. Fantastic. Yeah. So you do an LP on this lady um, and then you've got your kind of two differentiations of oh, it's cloudy with high neutrophils, low glucose, high protein. We're thinking it's bacterial. If it's viral, um, it's more likely to be clear, mild rise in the white cell count. So not as high as in a bacterial, um, but a lot of lymphocytes, normal glucose, normal or a mild rise in that protein. Um Fantastic. So you do a gram stain as well. And can you state the most common cause of organism of meningitis and describe the appearance of this gram stain? It's tricky, but kind of the things you want to be looking at here, are these are the actual organism. I don't know what this is. I think it's just connective tissue, to be honest, that you've gotten in the sample. But it's these bits here that you want to be looking at. So it's actually gram positive because it's purple. Um, OK, this is a kind of a trick question, but you've got your gram positive diplococci here. And I'm glad this is kind of maybe trip some of you up because your most common cause of organism of meningitis is actually strep pneumonia. Um, so just important to be aware of. So normally it kind of, you'll have a infected prodrome, kind of might have a runny nose or a sore throat and that's where these bacteria come from. And then it can come through the eustachian tube and enter the meninges kind of that way. Um, it's a lot more common than your meningococcal septicemia associated with the rash and things like that, um, which, yeah, is strange. But that might be to do with kind of the new vaccines they've got for um, your meningococcal meningitis, which makes the strep a lot more common. Um, but, yeah, just good to be aware of. I mean, we'll go through a few more gram stains. Oh, I'm sorry. I've put the answer on there. But what kind of organism do you think this that we're looking at here. Yeah, so this is your Neisseria meningitis, so your gram negative diplococci. Fantastic. Um, and then can anyone name the kind of empirical antibiotic therapy? So your first line for meningitis. Yeah, septraxone. Yeah, amazing. Okay, and what about in a penicillin allergy? The prophylaxisin. You probably can. Um, I have IV meropenem just because it's nice and broad. Um, we love it in emergency because you can give it covers a lot of organisms, um, very broad spectrum. Um, although it is a carbapenem, so people would say different things about, oh, giving it in penicillin allergy. But there's actually not that much evidence that there's cross reactivity between giving a cephalosporum and a carbapenem. Um, so, yeah, I've gone with carbapenem. But, yeah, you can, if Cipro, you probably, I would think, would cover it as well because it's gram neg. Yeah. 
Okay. And what kind of, so in pneumococcal, which is your most common form of meningitis, there's an additional management step that you can take. Does anyone know what else we can give? Yeah, dexamethasone, yeah. Do you know kind of what, at what dose? That's a hard question. Um, and when you can give it as well. Yeah, definitely. So you can't give it under three months, um, which is important to remember. There's not much evidence that it has an effect on controlling some of that inflammation in such young children. Um, but I've got 10 milligrams IV dex um, and you can give that first dose within the first 12 hours of giving the antibiotic. Um, if you give it after that, it's there's not much evidence that it improves, but it reduces that intracranial inflammation and it also reduces the complications of kind of your sensing, sensory neural hearing loss or neurological impairments. So it is, it is good to give if you can. And what else do you need to do in um, kind of the management of meningitis? Who else do you need to inform? Do you mean kind of would you give the ceftriaxone before the dex? Yeah, so as long as you've got it within that interval, you give the ceftriaxone because you want to get those antibiotics in that's going to treat the infection initially. But you can give dex within a 12 hour window of given that first antibiotic, whereas after that, it's not very effective. But yeah, I'd say give the antibiotic first because you want to get on top of that infection. And then you're giving kind of a bit of steroid to help with the inflammation. Yeah, exactly. So meningitis, just important to remember, it is notifiable. So you want to notify Public Health England. And why is this so important? Yes, inform the contacts because they need um, PO, Cipro, um, a single dose. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, so then a tiny bit about encephalitis. So obviously meningitis and encephalitis can present together as meningoencephalitis. So what additional symptoms or features would make you concerned about and diagnosis of encephalitis in this lady. Yeah, kind of a change in behaviour, confusion. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, neurology. Yeah. Amazing. So I've got drop in GCS as well. Um, kind of any psychiatric symptoms or aphasia or focal or partial seizures. Okay. So hopefully the scan helps here. Um, can anyone remember which kind of lobe is affected in encephalitis and why does that link to people having focal seizures? Yes, yeah, so that's your temporal lobe here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So you get those kind of partial seizures affecting your temporal lobe. Um, and you've got that hyperdensity of the white matter and the cortex and the of the medial temporal lobes and the insular cortex is just how it appears radiographically. OK, and your most common cause of encephalitis. It's the last question, guys, you've, you've done so well. It's been long. I'm sorry. Yes, fantastic. Happy simplex virus. Um, so in children um, and adults, kind of older children, it's normally HSV-1 from cold sores, um, whereas in neonates, it's HSV-2 from kind of the genital tract, normally contracted during birth. Thank you so much. It was a lot longer than I intended, but I hope it's been useful. Um, any questions, pop them in the chat. I will endeavour to answer um, the question from before, um, but that is the feedback form if you could fill it out we'll send you the slides um and i'd be so grateful um thank you all for coming um and being so engaging it makes it so much easier